Good morning, church. <laughs> Family of God. I love it. That's a, just a... You never get tired of being a part of the family of God. It's just uh, marvelous everywhere. Um, I was reflecting last night during one of those times when you wake up and you're, <laughs> you're reflecting um, how that um, in earthly terms, wisdom is often spoken of as moderation. You know, do all things in, in moderation. But as I was thinking about the nature of love, and especially God's love, um, love should never be done in moderation. <laughs> you know, we were invited into a love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and that was meant to be a passionate love relationship, and, and He loves us passionately, and we love Him in return. And, and there is just this um, nature of the church as the community of God that we're called to love. And we're not called to love in, <laughs> in small amounts. We're, we're meant to love with abandon. And we love um, those that he loves. And I just thank him for the opportunity to be loved and to give love, to extend love. Let's just, before we go into our word, let's just, again, just, just pray. Father, I do thank you just for your abounding love, that you so loved us that you did not leave us to our own destruction and our death, but that you sent your Son. And I praise you for that. I pray that as we go into your word, a revelation of your nature and your character, that it would just uh, speak to our hearts in beautiful and wonderful ways, powerful ways. And I just give this all into your hands and your presence. Amen. Well, we've been going through a series in uh, Genesis through the life of Abraham, and we've just been focusing um, on his story and especially his faith. This is going to be a little bit different um, sermon today. We're going to not focus primarily on Abraham. We're going to look at Genesis 16, and we're going to be looking at uh, this question of where is God when life just goes off the rails? Um, does God see my pain when everything is just going sideways and when everything looks like there can be no remedy? Uh, there is no fixing the situation. Does God hear my cries? Does he see my tears? And there's this question that... Um, plagues many people. And it's not so much that whether God sees, but as so much as does God see and care? Does he, does he do both? And so this is the, the question that I want to take a look at today. And I want to uh, look at the life of a, a woman that by all accounts should not be in God's story. She, she shouldn't be in Scripture. But then when I, I look at Scripture and, and I look at God's story, what I find is that almost no one has any business being a part of his story. It's, it's all beginning to end, misfits and, and people that are broken. And, and, uh, and so it is that uh, we're going to look at a, a woman. Her name is Hagar. And she, uh, she's marvelously woven into God's story. So I want to take a look at her, her life. I I have been intrigued by Hagar for, well, for years, and I've, I think I've wanted to preach on her for like eight years. I never have. I've never, never preached on a Hagar. But we're going to do so today, and I'm kind of excited about it. Well, Hagar is from Egypt, and it's interesting because there are uh, two places in Scripture that are symbolic of really sin and rebellion against God. One is Babylon, and the other is Egypt. And I brought this point out that, you know, Abraham is from Ur of the Chaldees. The Chaldees is, you know, Babylon's the home, the, the, the capital of, of, of the Chaldeans. And, and so you have Egypt and, and Babylon. And yet we find, you know, God is pulling people and drawing people's lives out of, you know, some really 
dark places. Uh, uh, Abraham was a moon worshiper in all likelihood. Um, he comes from a history of people that worshiped other gods, and Hagar is no doubt much the same. You know, she's come from Egypt. They worship the sun god. Uh, um, so not pristine backgrounds by any means. And so as we approach their stories, I want us to see God's, it's a story of God and his redemption. Now the setting is Abram is 85 years old and Sarah is 75. That's getting up in pretty high numbers now, and especially for a couple that has still a dream of one day holding a baby of their own. You know, having a child together. And uh, God has birthed this dream into them. And it's, but it's, but dreams, how many of you know, are often aches. And especially unfulfilled ones. There's this, this longing, this aching, this desire. And it's, it's while it's a, a God desire, it can also be quite um, painful at times. And, and I think it was for Abraham and Sarah longing for, for children, grandchildren, great children. And so God's promise to them was that they would have offspring without count. As the stars of the, of the sky at night, so shall your offspring be. And through you, through your seed, singular, all the people of the world would, would find blessing. This is the great promise, but no children, no children as of yet. So we, we come to Genesis 16. I want to begin with verses 1 and 2. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. That's our first mention of Hagar in Scripture. And it says that she was a, uh, a servant. Well, the word there is really a, a female slave. Um, she's a bond servant. She's, and what we find is that you know, they say that quite often 50% of the population were, were really slaves in the ancient world. And so she is a member of that class. Now, we then continue on in verse 2, and it says, And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Well, first, two points I want to draw out of this. And the first one is, this is a bad idea all the way around. There's just nothing, <laughs> there's nothing uh, redeeming or good that really about this idea. Um, and the question, have you ever wanted something so badly that you were willing to entertain a really a bad idea? You know, and especially, I find especially that when God's promises to us are involved, when his dreams, when his visions, and we have that deep longing, as, as they do for a child, that there is this impatience, there is this, and we just want to nudge God a little bit, you know, just help him along and uh, get him moving along his way. And so I, I think this is really where they're at. And so Sarah has come to the point where she is willing to entertain, you know, something that is um, not God's plan, and it's not a, not a good idea at all. And so uh, I just want to encourage you that if you have a call upon your life, a dream that God has birthed in your heart, be patient. Let God be God, and let him bring it about in his way, in his timing. I find that throughout History. I found this to be true in, in lives that my own life and lives that I've watched. Whenever we try to make things happen in our own strength, our own way, in our own power, they don't turn out well. Good things come to those who let God be God. And I want to encourage you that. Let Him fulfill that dream, that vision that He's placed inside your heart. Now, do you notice that Sarah's words here? It's telling. She says, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. There's, a, there's an interesting thing that takes place in the lives of people that have an unfulfilled dream or longing in their life. So often, 
as the, the hurt progresses, as that ache progresses, we begin to shift blame onto God. And God begins to be thought of as the problem more than the answer. And, and this is, I fear, where probably Sarah's at. It's, 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 it's an unconscious thing. You just you don't consciously think about doing, you know, thinking of God as more your problem than your answer. But I want to warn us about that as well, is, is be careful. Um, let God be God, but always see him as the answer. Never, never um, begin to see God through a negative light in, in that way. The second thing I want to it's a bad idea. <laughs> it's the same as the first, but, but it's especially bad because Abraham <laughs> listens to his wife, Sarah. And um, there's, a, there's a saying, you know, that friends don't let friends drive drunk. Well, let me expand that thought. Friends don't let friends do dumb ideas, take action on dumb ideas. You know, this is one where Abraham really should have had the wisdom and insight to speak up and just say, Sarah, this isn't God's way. This is not God's plan. This is a bad idea. Let's put the brakes on this one. So if you have a speak up, <laughs> please speak up. <laughs> don't, let, don't let people you love go down paths of desperation that are not going to end up in a good place. Let's continue, verse 3 to 6. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. It says, Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. Hagar's story. I want to take just a moment. And I want to contemplate, and this is, we don't know her backstory. But I want to consider what her backstory was probably likely, what it looked like. And I want to enter into Hagar's life. Now, we have one strong clue, and that's that Hagar is a slave in Abram's household, and she is a slave without any family um, with her. She's alone. Hagar's a young woman. And so you, this question is, how does one become this, you know, a bond servant, an indentured servant, a slave in the ancient world? Well, there's a couple ways. You could be born into indentured servitude. But in her case, it's more likely that she was sold into slavery. Now, in the ancient world, there is no safety net. Um, if somebody gets hurt, there is no L&I, there's no unemployment insurance, there's none of these things. And a vast majority of the people that are not considered to be in the slave class, they are working poor. And literally, they are just one paycheck away from starvation and, and nothingness. And likely... She has been sold because her family had to sell her. Now, you can imagine if her father, for some reason, is sick or he's, he's injured himself, he's not able to work, and you would sell everything that you had, anything of value. But, you know, when you're that working class, the working poor, you don't have much of value, and you expend those resources very, very quickly. And you begin to go into, like, payday debt. You begin to borrow a little bit of money to, to get you over these hard times. But you know the story. 
you never seem to catch up. Those payday loans, the high interest usury. So there comes a knock at the door. And um, the man says, the debt's got to be paid. Her father and the man speak, and her mom comes over and whispers. Then they begin looking at the children. And her dad comes over and says, Hagar, I love you, honey, but I have to sell you. Think about the, the emotions, both their father and daughter in that, in that moment, you know? And I, I, I can't help but think about um, Hagar's, why me? Why not one of my sisters? Why not one of my brothers? Why me? Why did dad choose me? Why did he sell me? Why am I the one that has to pay this price? Now, we're not told how Hagar ends up in the household of Abram, but she does, and there probably she was sold multiple times. But she's now in Abram's household, and Abraham isn't from Egypt, which means that when they move, she has to go with them, which means that she knows that she'll likely never see her family again. Mother and father never see them again. It's easy when you're in this position to begin to ask questions of why. Why is my life take this course? God, where are you? Did you see me when I, when I cried night after night after that I, I was sold? Did you see that? Were you there? Now, Hagar is apparently a good servant. She, she works hard and she's faithful and she is entrusted with the position of being Sarah's handmaid. And, and this is a position of, of some trust. And, and so she's proved herself to be a good servant. But I doubt when Sarah comes to her and pitches this idea to her that she thinks this is a good idea. I do not believe that when she was a little girl playing in the dirt behind her house, that she thought, dreamed of her life as being a surrogate wife of an 85-year-old man. I, I, I don't think that she thought and wanted this to be the plan of her life. Do you understand that there's a lot of, there's a lot of why, God, why, that is likely in the backstory of, of Hagar. So Hagar finds herself with child. And people begin to treat her differently. They begin to treat her like she's important. She's carrying the master's child. That makes her, for the first time in her life, probably somebody of some importance. And, and it seems that it goes to her head a little bit, and she begins to act in a very immature way. And she and Sarah begin to butt heads. They, they, they begin to... Um, have conflict in the relationship. And it says that Hagar treated Sarah with contempt. And I'm sure it was returned with, with anger and, and harshness in return. We find that Sarah comes to Abram and, and she says, she's angry. And she says, may the wrong done to me be on you. <laughs> it's your fault. You got us into this mess. <laughs> And, and then she, there's this phrase that I've, I've been intrigued with for years, but it's this, may God judge between me and you. <laughs> it's, just, it's just basically this, this is a, a last resort statement that you just throw out and you say, I am innocent. I have no part in this. The, you are to blame and may God come and just find this out and discover this and, and make it, you know, abundantly clear to all, you know, and... Um, well, Abram's response is, <laughs> my idea, <laughs> this, was, this was your idea. Of course, he went along. <laughs> but we, we, we see this, this interaction between them, you know. And um, so ultimately, Abram says, she's your servant. You do to her as you, as you wish. Well, the conflict escalates, apparently. 
And after some very intense moment, Hagar says, I'm out of here. That's enough. I've had it. And so she runs off. Now remember, Abraham is living at this point in time in Hebron. Hagar heads for Egypt. She heads south. And the Nagav, as we were talking about the Nagav, it's a desert territory, wilderness, very rough. She makes it almost out of the Nagav. And it says in verse 7 that the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. Now, Shur is not a town. It's, not a, it's, a, it's a desert. And it's more formidable than the Nagav. And this is not a good place for a, a woman alone and pregnant. If she goes into the Shur... Um, she's likely not coming out alive, she or the baby. And so she's sitting at this well, and she's in a bad place. She knows that her life is off the rails. And she is no doubt crying and calling out to God. I think she realizes that this is not good. I'm in a very bad and vulnerable place. And so... She's at this spring when the angel of the Lord comes to her. Now, you get the impression very quickly that this is not a run-of-the-mill angel, that this is a very special, exalted angel. This is, now I'm, I'm speculating, but he has all the earmarks of Gabriel uh, come from the very presence of God himself, the messenger of God. And he comes to, to Hagar, and we have no idea, again, I don't know if it is Gabriel or not, but he calls her by name. And I want you to just note the significance of that. He calls her Hagar. He knows my name. God knows my name. And then he asks her a very pertinent, important question. In verse 8, he asks her, Hagar, servant of Sarai, do you know where you have come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. That question, where have you come from and where are you going? Do you know the answer to that question? Do you know your life's trajectory, where it's going? Do you know where the plans that you have put in motion, do you know where that path leads? That, that this is what the angel is asking Hagar, have you thought through what your next step is? Have you thought through what, where you're going with your life? Now, her response to the angel was, I'm fleeing. I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. My question is, what are you fleeing from? Are you running from anything? I, I find that people all around, more than you'd realize, are, are, are fleeing. They're running from things. A painful childhood, a bad marriage, abusive situations, a bad job. You know, people, especially fallen humanity, has a, a pattern, a predictable pattern is that we're runners. We're fleers. And, and we're often running from things. And sometimes those things are long distant in the past. And you know the problem about fleeing is so often that what we're running from is not out there. It's in here. It's in here. Their memories, their 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 hurts, their these are the things. You can't run from yourself. Um, and so that question where are you going? Where have you come from and where are you going? Now, Hagar, she's been crying out, God, are you there? Do you see my tears? Um, do, do you see this pain, this situation that I'm in? When life is off the rails, when you sense that things are sliding out of control, the single most important thing that you can do is stop. Just stop. 
That's what she does. She's at that, that spring. She stopped. In your stillness, you can begin to hear God's voice. You can begin to sense God's presence. You can begin to hear from the Lord. Now, in her case, an angel comes to her. But so often, we're asking those questions continually over and over and over again. God, where are you? God, where are you? But in our anxiety, we never give God a chance to answer. So often, God is speaking. We're just not still enough to hear his voice. We just don't hear his, his voice. So stop. Get quiet. Let the Lord speak into your life. Verses 9 to 14 it says that the angel of the Lord said to her, and, and he says, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all of his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who, had, who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Now, this passage, this particular set of verses begins with a real toughie. <laughs> I mean, a real return to your mistress and submit to her. Ouch. I mean, that, everything in human nature, pride, that's, that's a hard one. But sometimes the way forward is the way back. That's a true. Sometimes the way forward is, is to go back, to return to where you've come from. And sometimes the way to rise above our pain and our conflict is humility. Is to let go of our pride and just submit. To. And so this is the, her instruction from the angel of the Lord. A hard, this is a hard thing to admit that you were wrong and you have to go back to eat humble pie, so to speak. Well, I want you to notice that God didn't send her back without a promise. He, he gave her a vision, a dream of how life could be. And he told, tells her, Behold, you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael. Does that phrase sound familiar at all? Behold, you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael. That's partly why I think it's Gabriel. It's, it's the same words that he spoke to Mary. But I want you to know Is Ishmael. Do you know what Ishmael means? It means the God who hears. The God who hears. That's what Ishmael stands for, what it means. And the Lord, the angel speaks through the Lord, uh, for the Lord, and he says, the Lord has heard your affliction. He's seen your misery. He's seen your oppression. He's seen your poverty. He's seen your pain. He's aware of it. God sees, and he hears, and he knows. He knows what, 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 what you've been going through. He, he sees it all. And in verse 13, it says, so she called the name of the Lord, who spoke to her, you are a God of seeing. You are the God who sees. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. I have here in this barren, desolate place, this place where I thought my life was just about over and off the rails and unfixable, I have found the one, I have discovered the one who sees me who cares for me, who looks after me. She names that place Bir Lahai Roy, which is the well of, 
of the living God who sees. God sees me. God cares for even me. This is the story of, of Hagar, that in her pain, that God has entered into her world. He's entered into her dis- despair, and he's called her by name, Hagar, and he says, I see you. I see you. It's wonderful. It, but Hagar's story is not just her story alone. Because it's our story too, and we're invited to be a part of this story. Because in Christ, God did not send an angel. He came, and he entered into our world because he saw, because he saw our pain, our destruction, our, 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 our death. He, he saw it all. And so he came himself. And he did not come in opulence, quite the opposite. He came to a a barn. And he was laid into a manger. This is not the story of of kings and and royalty. He came to um, poverty. He came to the working class. Instead of... um, only instructing others to humbly submit. He himself submitted. Um, From the beginning, he was mistreated, he was oppressed, he was despised. Not an easy life. He came. He entered into our life. It is this Jesus that we discover who God is and his nature for us. You know, it's, it's this beautiful love story. That God is the God who does see, who does care, and he does come. He comes near. Hagar's story doesn't end here with this encounter. Um, God gives her a dream and a vision. And look at verse 10. It says, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for a multitude. I'm going to multiply your offspring. Does that, again, sound familiar? It, it's the same promise that God gave to Abraham. And now, but it's being extended to Hagar and to Ishmael. Your offspring shall be without number. Um, I looked up, I googled, there are 436 million people on planet Earth today who call Ishmael their father. Think about it. Every Arab alive today traces his lineage back to this man, Ishmael. It's an incredible promise that God gave to Hagar, and he has more than than delivered on that. I want to tell you, it's a promise of love. (laughs) Now, when we take a look at Ishmael, Ishmael, I believe his greatest longing in life as he grew up, and I'm going ahead of the story just a little bit here, was for the unreserved affirmation of a father. He didn't have it. But that was his deepest longing. And you know, Sometimes the hurts of a man outlive him. He passes that on to his children and great-grandchildren and children, you know, so on and so on and so on. And I see this legacy, this heritage. And in verse 12, it says, He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone against him. And it says that he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. My daughter, she likes to, um, she works with a lot of kids with a lot of emotional baggage and a lot of hurt, and, and they act out. And you, they're just, they're acting out the pain, the hurt that's inside of them. And there's a sense in which Ishmael is just acting out. And um, 
I want to give you a dream. Because I don't believe that God promised Ishmael that you shall be a people without number, without a redemptive hope. And I want to say that one day, the people of Ishmael are going to discover the love of a father the way that Hagar at a well discovered the love of her heavenly father. This, I'm looking forward to watching this play out. It's a marvelous story, a love story. I, I just see, you know, Isaac and Ishmael are half-brothers. They both have this immense legacy. And in the love of a father, two sons are going to stand. And it won't be the love of Abraham. It's going to be the love of Heavenly Father. This is the car God. Look at I'm telling you, this is his heart. So in closing, you have and I have been invited into God's story. It's a tapestry of, of redemption, of beauty. He takes these raw, very plain, impoverished threads that are our lives, and he weaves lives of gold and silk, his own life, into ours. And we're this tapestry, this beautiful family of God. It's, it's a story of his redemption for us. And his story is not just for the saints. His story is not just for great men and women throughout history. His story has always been about the Hagars, about the Mary Magdalene's, about the Jephthahs, about the Davids. A son so far, so low on the totem pole <laughs> that he's not even invited to the feast. You know, God has always been looking for those that are considered cast-offs, those that cry out tonight and say, God, are you there? Do you see my life? Do you see the pain? And do you see the hurt? And God's resounding answer in Christ Jesus is I'm there. I am there. He stands with us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I adore your love for us. I thank you that in our despair, in our brokenness, in our sin, our rebellion, in our total running away from you, that you've never given up on us. Your Father's heart, that redemptive heart, has always been in place. And I thank you that, that today we do not have to wonder about your love. That today we do not have to ask these questions. Are you a God who sees, a God who hears, and a God who cares? 2,000 years ago you answered that question with an emphatic yes. I thank you that you still enter into our dirt. You still enter into our pain. And I praise you that you have not left us as orphans. Those that cannot be cannot look after themselves, that you have come and you have wrapped us in your arms and you've called us your own. I thank you for that, the call to belong. Praise be to Jesus for all eternity. Amen.